Hi, I'm Otto Pensler. I'm in my office in the basement of the Mysterious Bookshop here in Tribeca in New York. And you just had a little look at our new filing system. Uh, in spite of hundreds of feet of shelves, uh, we have uh, this enormous number of rare books that I've been cataloging and pricing for the last couple of months. And uh, that's, that's the best we could do is put them in little stacks vaguely in alphabetical order. Uh, but we're here to, to, today to talk about P.D. James and collecting P.D. James. <clears throat> Phyllis, which is how I got to know her from the very first time I met her, it was at a banquet. Uh, she had only had a couple of books at the time, and uh, I was fairly new to the mystery field. Uh, I didn't really know much about her. I hadn't read the books, but I knew she was... Uh, already being touted as a major writer, <clears throat> pardon me, as soon as, and she was, uh, fairly quickly after she started writing. And uh, we were sitting and chatting together, and uh, she didn't know too many people in the room, I didn't know too many people in the room, and we, and we got along really well. And that initial meeting uh, became the basis for a very long, I won't quite say lifelong, but uh, until she stopped touring in, in the States, um, we, we spend a lot of time together over the next 30 years or so. Um, she would come, because she was so successful, Scribner would bring her to the United States to tour to do signings. And of course, she always came to my bookshop to do signings. And um, in the 80s in particular, and early 90s, I was going to London on a regular basis. So it was fairly common when she came to New York for us to go out for dinner, sometimes just the two of us, but frequently also with some other people from her publishing house. <clears throat> and when I was in England, she was very, very close friends with Harry Keating, HRF Keating. And I used to stay at Harry Keating's house. In fact, even though Harry's gone, his widow, Sheila, uh, now in her 90s, still invites me, and when I go over to London for the London Book Fair and other things, I still stay there. Uh, anyway, we frequently went to dinner, often the four of us, Phyllis and I and Harry and his wife, uh, which, and they were always jolly. She was very funny uh, and loved to laugh, uh, <clears throat> even though she was kind of an intimidating presence to a lot of people. Uh, one time she came to New York, and this is kind of an embarrassing story. I, I was thinking about whether I should tell it or not, but I will anyway, because I, I love telling stories that reflect poorly on me. There are so many to pick from. <laughs> we were going out, we were going to have drinks. Uh, she didn't, we didn't have time for dinner. And this is in the, uh, the era when I was single. I, uh, it was after my first marriage and before my second. And I belonged, uh, I was working at ABC Sports in those days, and uh, I belonged to a club. I had read so many great British crime novels where, where the hero of the book or, or the major characters in the book always had their club. And they would go to the club for dinner and, uh, and read the paper and talk with their friends and have a drink at the bar and so on. And I thought this was the coolest thing. So I joined a club. Um, it's called the Gaslight Club. It was located in two beautiful brownstones in the East 50s in New York. And it was two buildings, and one building was a very elegant restaurant, and the other uh, building was a bar, a beautiful bar. Um, and you, you'd go and check your coat or whatever, and then go up a flight of stairs to this beautifully carpeted, uh, place with soft classical music playing in the backgrounds and the walls lined with books. It was like, it was like a library. And it was so elegant. The, the one thing that, uh, that perhaps was different from the London clubs that I read about in Kipling and, and Doyle and, and other Victorian writers was that the bartenders and, and wait staff, what we used to call waitresses in those days, were beautiful young women wearing the kind of clothing that they would not wear on the street. Um, they were scanty, not vulgar in any way, but they were definitely uh, provocative. 
And I went there regularly with, with various friends and, and just loved the ambiance, loved the, the music and the books and so on. And without really thinking it through, obviously, I took Phyllis there for drinks. And we walked in and one of the beautiful young women greeted us and Phyllis said, hello, dear, and looked at me and said, oh, my. <laughs> and we had, we had a wonderful time. We chatted. We talked for the rest of my life. Whenever Phyllis would introduce me to somebody, I said, oh, this is Otto Penzler. He took me to a strip club in New York the last time I was here. It wasn't like that at all, but it was really, but it was really nice. But that's how she always remembered that night. Anyway, Phyllis... Uh, started writing and uh, became very, very successful. The early books were published in very small quantities, and so they're quite rare. I have, at the moment, in the store, which I don't normally have, a copy of Cover Her Face, which is her first book. This is a British book published by Faber and Faber, and she stayed with Faber and Faber in the UK for her whole career. Um... This is a very rare book because there were so few copies, but this is a first edition, and there she has autographed it with a very nice handwriting. She had a lovely handwriting, as you see. Collecting Phyllis James, P.D. James, is tricky if you want the complete set because the early books are very expensive. This book is over $5,000, just as an example. Her second book is just as rare. A Mind to Murder. And look at the condition. I mean, the jacket is almost like new. And uh, again, there it is, signed on the title page. This also is over $5,000, uh, partly because of its rarity, partly because of the condition. Her third book, she's getting a little bit more popular now, is Unnatural Causes, which is also quite an expensive book, and it's also autographed, but this is 3500 somewhat less than the others. And the Faber books are easy to tell first editions. The copyright page always looks like that, and when they reprint, when there's a second printing, they print Second printing, which is a great clue to tell you that it's not a first edition. Now, the American edition, uh, the same title, was published by Scribner. She started with Scribner and stayed with Scribner for many, many years before she moved to Knopf. But that was her primary publisher for many years. Uh, and if you remember from, if you've been tuning in and remember, one of the ways to tell a Scribner first edition is you go to the copy page, copyright page and there's a capital A. When I talked about Philo Vance, uh, that was a key thing. It began in 1929 and uh, they maintained that system for many, many years. As the books became more and more popular, they had greater and greater print runs. And here's a copy of an early book, The Black Tower, published by Faber, and it's only 250. American editions are, once we get into the later books, are fairly common. They were done in fairly large quantities, and they're very reasonable. Here's an advanced proof copy of Innocent Blood. This is one of the two books that broke her out in America and made her a bestseller. Even though it's in fine condition and there aren't that many of these around, it's only $15. She did a nice, a beautiful limited edition of Murder in Triplicate, which is, as you might guess, three short stories. This was done by a special uh, limited edition publishing company called Belmont Press in 2001. It has three stories. Uh, this was done in 2001. The stories have been done in previous years and it is numbered and signed somewhere. There it is. It was done in 150 copies. This is copy number 131, signed by her. 
and this is in perfect shape and uh, it's only $250 I thought it would be more I, I'm constantly surprised <laughs> Otto's House of Bargains um, this is an, an omnibus that was done of several of the early books uh, which it turns out to be an extremely rare book it's $150 it's signed um, which is not common for this book. What is the only signed copies that I've ever seen? And it reprints three of her earlier books, the P.D. James Omnibus. Was was that reprinted like after she had more success, they went back and... It, yeah, this was, by the time uh, this was reissued, those early books had become so rare and so hard to find that people wanted a hardcover copy but they, it had gone out of print. They could find paperbacks because it was being reprinted all over the place. But this was done um, in 1991, if, if memory serves. It's so hard for me to remember things. But not this. Yes, this is 1982, actually. Signed in 1991. Hmm. But the early books were uh, 20 years before that or more. Uh, the later books, as I was saying, this is how we show signed books in our store. We have these bands that say signed on, so that we can look on the shelf and find signed copies fairly quickly. Uh, this is the first edition, uh, but now by, by this time she's getting very popular. This is uh, also 1982, like the Omnibus, uh, but it's, and it's a true first of Skull Beneath the Skin, and it's signed. And it's $85. It's much more affordable than the very early books. And, yeah, we have, we have a lot of P.D. James. I love her, and so do a lot of my customers. You know, the Adam Dalgleish series, uh, which is what she started with, uh, he became a, a, a Scotland Yard uh, inspector who became a, a, a very, very popular figure and was made into uh, television movies uh, shown in America on PBS. And uh, he was joined in some of those books with a character named Cordelia Gray, who became so popular in her own right that she then wrote several books involving only Cordelia Gray. Here's a, here's a later book. This is 1997, and it's inscribed, not just signed, but inscribed, uh, first edition, and it's $45. So you can see as the books got later and later, they had bigger and bigger print runs, and they became much more affordable. That is P.D. James.